to save you from a lot of those hardships. Trust me, they're coming. Because what we think of our educational background, we think it's going to be our leveraged asset when we go out to teach, when we go out to perform. It doesn't always work that way. So let me back up for a second. I'm going to give you a pretty dramatic story. And I'm going to come forward, but I'm going to show you the formula that of how to dissect this story. And then I want you to insert your story into it, into the formula. So, hang on. When my father came back from the Korean War, that's the first time he started meeting his mother. And those were some of the most <coughs> formative experiences for me in, as a child. And when you're, when, you're, when you're young, you think everything is your fault. It's just part of our narcissistic development. I didn't understand, no one understood at the time what PTSD was. Around the same time that we had that family disintegration, uh, my dyspraxia, if you had any of you in here in motor, motor coordination classes, mm, they're coming. dyspraxia is a severe uh, dysfunction in the ability to acquire physical skills. So being, we didn't know, uh, quite understand what dyspraxia was at the time, it was just loaded under a term osteochondrosis. We, we couldn't adhere our connective tissue to our growth plates in the same way. So just a little later on in my development, I grew eight inches in three months, which is like being stretched on a rack. So again, we didn't have the type of industry we have now. We didn't have expertise like you're involved in. So it was just like horse limb that was rubbed on, on joints. They were severe growing pains. But any type of conventional exercises would, would just shred me. It would be locked in like a corset of agony at any time I do an activity. So, that quickly led to obesity. The inability to exercise and poor nutrition, this is a super storm. So with that family dysfunction, not understanding what physical violence was, the, the social problems that resulted from that were much more severe than the educational problems. You can see that that background story would push me in a certain direction. And you can pretty much guess where it would head. So I, I, I ended up in a, I remember my mother not leaving my father. I didn't understand why. But I remember practicing what looked like martial art moves out in the pasture every morning. She tried to defend herself so she could protect us kids. There were four of us. And that, it imprinted on me. It wasn't for years later until I actually had my first martial art class. I was terrible at it. I was such a terrible student. The dyspraxia makes it impossible for you to learn motor sequence. So right now, I can't do left, right. I still look down at my shoes to where I had R and L written on it, or L and R. Right. So the, the inability to learn the motor sequences made it an awful experience. But then I had this one pivotal experience in high school where I was wearing sunglasses and I had an eye disease called uh, phagocytes. So it was put drops in my eyes, pops your pupils really well. I mean, you, I'm sure you've had the pupil dilation drops. Mm -hmm. Pretty, the photosensitivity pretty awful. So I'm wearing sunglasses in class and a senior came and smacked them off my face, told me, you know, you know I'm, I'm a jerk or whatever, things, trying to act cool in class. Pushed him away, leave me alone. And all I saw were the, the front view of his knuckles coming into my head and bounced back twice. And it didn't really hurt, it just was a snap of the neck. Then something happened. And this was the pivotal experience for me as a kinesthetic learner. He grabbed a hold of me and everything slowed down. It was like he was moving through molasses. And I, I, I moved out of the way and I saw it coming and I watched his hand explode into the wall. And just, the knuckles just, it was blood everywhere. And I was really excited by that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that sounds strange, but I, 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 I it, it just, it, later on that day, three of them came because I, uh, of that event, and then I got much worse. But I was still thrilled that whenever somebody would touch me, I had this map of what's going on in their body. So I, I went from one martial art to, to the next, trying to understand why I couldn't learn motor sequences. Yet, whenever somebody touched me, I, my nervous system lit up. And a 
long series of events. It was the sparring classes that I just thrived in. I couldn't, I couldn't combine right to left step. It was chewing bubble gum and swinging my hands was not happening. But as soon as we was in a sparring class where there was dynamic movement, I thrived. State championships like the regionals, regionals, the nationals, world championships. I ended up, the, you know, the, the young man that walked in, obese kid, learning <laughs> disabilities, parents not getting along, divorce. Now we're back to the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up winning for the U.S. five gold medals in five different uh, forms of martial art. Russian Sambo, Chinese Sanju kickboxing, submission grappling, Sport Jiu Jitsu, which is like full contact Jiu Jitsu, and amateur MMA. So those, those, those things mean, they, they really don't mean anything. Because for me, it was just, you touch me, and I can feel everything that's going on in your body. Except for the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any Russians in here? I'm going to apologize in advance. So, there was everybody here in the international community community, and then there were the former Soviet fighters. And I'd step across the mat from them, and you know, I was training 68 hours a day. I, 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 I took my classes, I tried to stay awake, but I went to university just so I had an extra amount of time to train. I, my undergrad was in philosophy because I need, I was trying to figure out how to think. I wasn't trying to figure out what to learn. You understand? I was just trying to understand, why does my brain work this way? So, Trust me, I'm going to get to the formula here. <laughs> or we're halfway through the story. In a long twist, I mean, the Soviets just destroyed us. In a long twist, I ended up as a first American to intern in the former Soviet Union, learning their form, their system of training, which they called the Russian Combat Skill and Scientific Consultant Practical Application. <laughs> and it was an acronym, which you can't pronounce because it's all consonants. But I, I studied there for six years, and then I, I, they would be so upset with me, because they'd show me something, they asked me to do it. One, my Russian was terrible. Two, explaining something to me, I'm not a verbal linguistic learner, I'm not an auditory learner, so it's got no, it's terrible, no, do like this. I, I, I can't. Then they would grab a hold of me, and my nervous, my nervous system would light up. So, They'd show me how to do it, couldn't figure it out. They'd do it to me, and I'd stand up. Do it again, do it again, do it again. Because the, the information was coming to me. They'd throw me down, they'd pick me up, they'd throw me down, they'd pick me up, they'd throw me down. I still have a smile on my face. Like, Who the hell is this crazy American? <laughs> there was a joke about around where, where I was training with them, with their Olympic trains for a while, that wherever I, Scott goes, it would get softer. Because that's the only way for me to think, figure things out. So they pound me into the ground. But that's when I was introduced to multiple style learning theory. That you have the verbal linguistic learners. I'm going to put some stuff up here. You have the auditory learners that can hear everything and they don't really care what I'm saying or what I'm writing on the board. You have the kinesthetic learners that only learn through movement. And you have the mechanoreceptive learners, the ones only that only learn when movement is done to them. There are uh, 71 different learning styles. As a coach, I've learned to say it, show it, and give them an experience of it so that they can physically feel it. In everything that I coach, I'm going to say it, I'm going to show them exa an example of the drill, and then I'm going to give them a way to access that skill before they have to perform it. There are different ways to do that, different strategies, and I'm sure that you're encountering those already. That's not why I'm talking. Along the way of figuring out how to train my body without my connective tissue ripping, I've had to come up with other ways to train. In Russia, I found one of them. They had a, they put me in a cosmonaut program of all things because in zero gravity, you can't lift weights. That should have been, uh, of course not. But for me, it was, I don't understand why. I would have an awesome deadlift in, in zero gravity. <laughs> but they developed a way of it, attaching tubes to walls so that you could use increased resistance of the tube to avoid having to add gravitation in order to cause stress to bones and tissue. That 
was the first time that I experienced traction in my joints, creating bodily strength. Because with that connective tissue, osteochondrosis, but my joint disease, the connective tissue doesn't lay down. If I, if I go to lift weight normally, it can lift off the fascia and it forms out like cotton candy. Like the average person will have tendonitis from overuse. But traction, traction causes the same osteoclastic, osteoblastic effect that bone growth from compressive weight. That's why we set bones that way. So it, it, this, that stuck with me. And then in 99, we were in Lithuania. No, no, yeah, we were in Lithuania and the team from Tajikistan throwing people off the map. I was just, I was excited about this. How, how, can, how can one grown man take another and throw them off the map? Not just throw them down, ah, I win. It was, it was amazing for me. So I, I, I sneak into their area, which wasn't probably wise. And <laughs> it's really scary. The, are there any Tajiks here? I'm not trying to offend anybody. <laughs> But they were swinging what looked like large wooden lollipops. It's the only way I could describe it at the time. Large wooden clubs that they were they were they were swinging at very short ranges of motion, and it instantly came back to what I had experienced in Russia: this notion of traction, torque, and leverage disadvantage. Uh huh. So I went and researched on my own, and you can look up Indian clubs, and that was. Uh, a short era in British history where they, they took these heavy clubs from Persia and India and made them into tiny little batons for aesthetic competitions. It was even an Olympic sport in the early part of last century. It's still back into the Olympics now. In 1988, it was readmitted under rhythmic gymnastics. So, but that's too small to cause a tractional effect. I mean, you, you need substantial load and force swing in order to have the force production to cause the connective tissue to, to resist and grow, and the bones as well. So this traction and torque is what I, I set myself upon. I'm like, I'm going to design this. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to figure out a way to do this to my own body. So I did. I went, and I, I went to an engineering firm. I took all of the money I had, and I had them create this prototype. It was basically a heavy bat, but it had to have a pro profile that was uh, safe to swing around my head because I chose the wrong sport. With a head this big, it should have been like chess or checkers. This is a huge target, right? So martial arts, not a good choice. So I created this thing I called the club bell. And I, I nicknamed it for myself. And the, the athletes that I was training as the US coach, obviously they wanted to participate in it too. So I, I got duplicates made because you had to get one mold. That was all the price to get one mold made. They started training it. The other teams I started to train started picking up on it and it spread like wildfire among the martial arts community. <coughs> My career shifted quite suddenly from being a, an amateur coach, which no money, great opportunities, lots of activity, fun things to do, but you're paying to do your job. You're not getting paid for it. I was just, I, I subsidized my activities by odd jobs whenever I could. I tried to manage to get my studies in at university. Not always. My image shifted. I became the coach, I became the trainer. I would teach these meth methods of traction and torque and it ended up being accepted by the special operations community because most of the people in the type of training I do are from military and law enforcement backgrounds, so now I'm a consultant to federal law enforcement agencies, like I, I, I'm the trainer for the US Marshals and all of that other hoopage here, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's a fun part of my atmosphere, uh, my background, but that's not the point of why, why, I'm, why I'm saying this. It, it spread out just because I was trying to explore something, and I became the, the person that had to promote these things. Did not want to be in this. I was not. That was not my goal. I didn't want to make money. I, I wanted my body to be better. I wanted to be able to do things that normal people could. And no matter how many gold medals were around my neck, I didn't feel like I could do that. I was still solving the dilemma of my childhood. That was my struggle. A business partner came along and he said, "Look, if you want to do this more often, you've got to figure out a way to monetize this. So let me help you." Nick. And I, I resisted. I can't. I can't be on video. I have a 
I'm not trying to act like William Shatner when I speak. These dramatic pauses are, is, is part of my dyslexia. I'm trying to access the word. Because I'll, I'll flip through the folders and try and find it, and it's usually hidden for a long time. So me being on a video, a like DVD, up in front of people was ridiculous to me. And writing. If you've ever tried to read anything digestible from a dyslexic, it sounds like Shakespeare on drugs. It's far <laughs> My, my early writing attempts were enough to send you into the nut house. <laughs> Actually, it, it did. So the, he found a way to create passive revenue streams for me to continue my research into finding out how, how could I provide these, these methods of traction and torque to increase connective tissue strength. Now you're suddenly put into the position where you have to promote something. Now you have to promote a brand. Here's your line of equipment. Here are your books and your videos. Here you have to go to the expos or in front of groups and try and sell your thing. And it felt awful. I'm not a salesman. I'm terrible at it. I'm easy to sell to. If I have money in my pocket and you have a good line, I'll absolutely give it to you. Here you go, the sell is great. I'm terrible at promoting myself. So I had this uh, lockdown part of my career for about five to seven years when I got out into the public after my university study because uh, they, I got my award of a Master of Sport Ensemble. And have any of you ever studied a, abroad in Eastern Europe? The, the reason our certifications aren't valid in the United States is because uh, athletic performance is required for your degree. And that's not legal in the United States. You can't have athletic performance as part of an academic degree. A master's degree in, in the former Soviet Union was the one and the same. So I had to be a national champion in order to qualify for a master of sport. And then my study begins. It's irrelevant. But now I'm put into the point, put into the position where I have to promote this brand, and it's asphyxiated me. I didn't want to be a salesman, I wanted to help people. I didn't want to sell equipment, I wanted to train people. I wanted to find other people that were having challenges with their, their motor coordination and provide them with solutions. Each time I stood in front of people, I, I, would, I, would, I would give the same talk. And then finally I said, screw it, I'm done with this. I'm gonna outsource all of this and let somebody else do all of the sales. I'm not gonna sell one thing, I'm not gonna pre pre present one brand. I'm going to go and I'm going to approach people as myself with all of my flaws and foibles, my William Shatner presentation <laughs> format, all of my indecipherable language skills, and I'm going to share that story. And that's when my career took off. And then I could actually go out and start to help people. And now that subsidizes my, my, my uh, ability to do things for free. That's where I really started to thrive in the summer and I have just last week, we were able to raise $1,000 for the Burn Children Recovery Foundation. Why? Because we, we have a career that can subsidize us to do things in a gratis format for issues that actually matter. But you have to find a way to, and this is the biggest thing for me, is you have to, can you see this? You have to find what you love, and you have to find what people need, and if you can live in between here and monetize that, you're always going to be successful. If it's a labor of love on the other side of there, or you can't monetize it, you're going to die. You're not going to be able to survive. And no matter how much you struggle, it's always going to be grinding your wheels to a halt. If you're over here in the soul-sucking aspect of the industry where you're only do, I'm serious, if you only do all of the, if you want to be a salesman and stand up here and try and say, it's an awful living, it makes you into a shell of a person. Because you're always trying to have a transactional relationship to the people you're speaking with. Like I, the only reason I'm speaking to you right now is because for the low, low price of, you can have this too. I could give a shit. 
my concern is being right here. I want to do what I love and indirectly be able to monetize the passive revenue streams I've created, my books, my DVDs. If you look up what that is, that's your own recognizance. But I want to be able to connect with the individual that is actually struggling and provide them with a solution or an alternative. So that was the story. Now let's dissect that narrative like we would in a lit class and look at what the formula is. Find out where you are in the process. And this is how I've done this in, a, in mentorship versions. Again, in Gretti's format, with, with, when I find a talented person, it's my responsibility, somebody who's come through the other end, to mentor them. Because the more people that are out there doing a fantastic job in the industry, the more people that are helped. I'm duplicating the results that I've discovered. It's a me. It's a genetic idea. All right. So they, they, these don't always, anybody reading, any of you I didn't read any Joseph Campbell? Oh, come on. You gotta read the hero's journey, because you're all going through it. There's a, there's a process. And it's not always static, it's not always in this order. Yeah, good luck reading it. I gotta write it down for my own reference. So sometimes the struggles become before the dreams. For me, I told you about my early childhood experience. I, I emphasized here the, the, the joint disease part. What I ended up discovering throughout the course of my career is that how fast someone recovers from a high intensity experience determines their longevity. The average lifespan of a soldier, a firefighter, or a police officer Nationally, the national average, 54 is their lifespan. Done. I'm 44. It scares the crap out of me. What is the number one killer? Is it fires, guns, knives, bombs? Stress-related heart disease. Stress-related heart disease. The job kills them at 54, sometimes younger. So what I ended up finding out, you know, coming from a family history of PTSD, is, is quite a remarkable solution. When we give them the high intensity experience of physical exercise and give them the strategies to recover their heart rate back from heart rate maximum, how fast they recover from heart rate maximum to resting heart rate is a analog for what their current state of health is. And the better that they become at those strategies, the longer that they're going to live. It's been researched now for the past three years, and it's going to continue to be researched because it's, it, was in, it was one of those deciding moments in my life. You may have the chance to be able to call upon your narrative and figure this out. Of what is the one thing in your life that is pivotal? What struggle have you been going through, and what dream are you aspiring to that you're going to be able to invest your entire life in? Because whatever you do, if you love it, you're going to have the sufficient amount of investment to bust your ass and do what it takes. You're going to work longer at it than anybody else. It's, you can't put a 9 to 5 in it. Because it's your love, it's your passion, it's your life. It's what defines you. Right. So after, during your struggle, you're going to figure out strategies. And you may be at the strategies part right now. I don't know what's going on in your life. But you're, and in university, we're usually, we're usually learning someone else's strategies or developing our own at the same time. You collect those. Do as much as you can and get as much, as much exposure to as many conflicting opinions as possible. Because over the course of that educational career, you're going to reproduce that for the rest of your life. And you know what my strategies were, right? I had the crew branding. If you can get through the other side to what happens when you no longer ask what you should be doing or what you ought to be doing or how you're unique. Well, if you can get through the other side and become yourself, that was very hard for me. I was worried that people would find out that I'm a fraud. Because I'm this fat, <coughs> uncoordinated, learning disabled kid hiding inside of this body. Who am I to teach these people? I'm the perfect person to teach these people. Because I wasn't given this. I worked my ass off for it. 
every single day against everyone. My guidance counselor, I remember this, it was a great story, came in, don't set your expectations too high. Maybe you should think about the third shift at the plant in the chicken refinery because that's a consistent job and it has good benefits. And I thought to myself, she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do that. And for three months that summer in between school, I would stand on a conveyor belt and I'd snap the necks of chickens to kill them. And <laughs> it, it was an enlightening experience. <laughs> and, I got, and I came back to the guidance counselor for my senior year and I said, no matter if I fail at everything, I refuse to do that ever again. I can fall on my face forever, but I'm going to try and I, I'm going to be happier failing than succeeding at that. And any job like it. Soul sucking. This isn't the last point, and this is and this is a point that I alluded to with Summer because Summer and I are able to do some of these things now. And we're gonna to continue to. And maybe and I hope, I really hope, that we can get to this point together. And that is and you know what, the whole time, the whole time you're going through all, the whole process, you're thinking about how can I serve others? How can I be a better service to the people that I, I can actually reach? If you find out what your struggle is, if you just, if you just jot notes down, if you never want to hear me again, I don't care. But if you just jot notes down on your own career and you will be able to define who, to whom you should be speaking. You can, you can connect with somebody just by sharing your struggle and letting them realize you're human. I held my image up for so freaking long to try and be this tough ass fighter who was impervious. I would figured out my way to move out of the way of the fist that was coming. I would learned my learning style. I would learned how to learn. And I just had to figure out what it was. Come along in this process for yourself. Usually when we're at the educational part, we're still developing struggles, or our strategies, but not, not all the time. It doesn't always happen in this order. And some, sometimes the levels are simultaneous. Like for me, this is a bit blurry, dreams and struggle. My dream was to stop struggling, <laughs> to get out of all of the bullshit that I was in. You may be developing your strategies and your image at the same time. That's not the, the formula only is useful so long as you use it as a tool and not as dogma. So, your turn. Where are you, what troubles are you having? What problems are you predicting when you leave this space to go and acquire your job? Where are you in the development of your image, what you ought to be? And where are you in breaking free from that and realizing what you are? Those are the questions you can ask of yourself if you don't, if you, if you don't want to ask them now. But we can walk through this process. We've got the other half. You can just stare at me for 25 more. <laughs> but if you have questions or even about the narrative that I gave you, the, the the sample story. I can give you some in insights on this one. Watching her teach now, it's amazing to me. Because I, can I tell them how we met? Sure, yeah. She was my babysitter. I was the nanny, and now I'm the head coach and international coach with him. Now she Crazy. comes in and she starts teaching, and I sit down and I listen, because I freaking learn. And that's amazing. And that's where, we, where it should be. We should be able to create a flat industry where we're helping mentor the people that are coming up so that they can become our teachers. That's our reach, that's our legacy in this industry and it's more significant than merely changing someone's waist size. And you guys are gonna be the ones that change lives like mine. It's just gonna take your voice once to say, no, 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 no. Those people probably didn't understand what your learning style was. Let's try the drill this way. Let's try the skill this way. Maybe you can maybe you can learn it this way. That's all you have to say is give somebody hope that they can figure something out. 
So what Coach is trying to ask you guys is if you are, um, if you have an idea about where your career is going, just offer it to the group so that we can dissect it and just tell us where you want to go and we'll kind of give you some feedback on where you could go or how you could improve upon yourself and finding that self. Does anybody know where they, what they want to do when they get out of here? Physical therapy? Why? I want to help people rehab. <coughs> Excuse me, I want to see people who aren't able to do things be able to do things. So if what is it, why is that important to you at all? Because, uh, like, for instance, children, like I've seen a lot of kids who aren't able to run, who are toe walkers, and I want to see someone who isn't able to run. Okay, so I know your passion, I know your target, I don't understand your motivation. That's, I, what, what, this is, this is the point. You need to understand your narrative. What makes this about you? Why, why should I listen to you? Because right now, you presented a competitive model. Now, you're, you, you're passionate about the industry, you know your target audience, you know the people that you could help, but what in it is actually you? That's what I want from you as my, as the person to whom I'm coming for, for this service. I enjoy acting in myself, and so I feel like if I'm able to connect with someone doing things that I love, and then instill that in them as well, I feel like that would be a great thing to do. What's your name? Joshua. Joshua. Still don't buy it. No. <laughs> I know what you're saying is true, but I don't hear Joshua in it. This is what I. This is what I mean. I want to help you pull yourselves out of the strategies portion and move into what is, why is it you? I can tell from the way that you're speaking that I would want to, to have you provide services for me, but I don't know why yet. And when you present yourself into the marketplace, you need to be able to present who you are. That's what's gonna distinguish you. You, there's no way to reproduce it, none. <coughs> you should be saying, it's because I'm Joshua, goddammit. <laughs> that's what you should, this is why. It's because of me. Not because of your education, not because of your, not because of your accomplishments, achievements, awards, titles, certificates. It's so easy to get sucked in. I was such a paper hunter. And I thought the next document, the next medal, the next trophy would be the thing that made me feel good about myself and made me feel like I'm not a salesman because then I have credibility. Right? It's never going to happen. You're never going to feel good about yourself that way. It's not outside of you. So, I get it. I've got your strategies. Well, I've got your target, but I don't hear your struggle. And I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not going to put you on the spot. But I want. I want to hear why. What is your motivation for doing this? If you can identify it, and you don't have to throw it in front of people, but I guarantee if you do, you're gonna launch yourself in your career. If you make it transparent, that's your catalyst. You know exactly where I'm coming from. You know exactly why I'm speaking. You know what my motivation is. You know why I'm unmoving in it. You can't challenge it because I've personally experienced it. And you know that I'm passionate about it because I have a reason to want to help. You can always stand your ground then and in, in front of any employer and prospective client, if you have that shoe in place, you, you're not taking a step back because you're the best person for the position. Your career will accelerate. Then you won't worry about what the job is or where you're going to get it or will it be enough money. I promise you, if you're you, you're going to find exactly the amount of monetary engine behind what you need to accomplish your goals. You just have to define what your motivation is. Where, where are you in the narrative? Look up the hero's journey. There are other ways to describe this than what I'm doing. Again, you have to understand my undergrad was philosophy, so deal with it. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not as a... Uh, as, uh, codified and scientific as some presentations when it comes to career development and talking about how you can optimize your search engine potential so that all of your buzzwords are hit and then you'll be pinged and then the search engine suddenly finds <laughs> where do they come from and lead generation. That's the old way of thinking. 
If you develop an online presence now and just start sharing your story, like say from a, from a blog, something as simple as a blog, if you connect it to social media, the, we are in such a strange era. I do a decimal system and card catalogs. <laughs> If you, can, if you put that out there, you will be found. The right people that want to hear your message are going to come to you. I went from having, I think it was 3,000 clients in, in the end of the 90s. I have 4 million readers a month now. The average conversion rate of that is 2 to 3% average. When I have a product release and I, I start to put out as much content as possible, that inflates to 10, 15%. If I even release an ebook, one, because they trust me and they know I don't put out garbage. I will never put out something that is garbage. Two, they know who I am in this message and why I'm motivated to do it. If you ever make it transactional, your prospects are going to smell it and they're gone. If you make it so that you're trying to make a living at it, I want to make money. They'll smell it and the only people that will follow you are such fickle customers that you probably never see them again anyway. Write it down. Where are you in the store? Connect it with, here's another one, here's another one. So the best man, not best man, he was one of my groomsmen in my wedding. He uh, started training with me, Jorge Colon. I, pub I asked him to publish an article about his background. He was an attorney, no job. Three weeks after I put it onto my blog, NBC called me. He's now the senior legal counsel for all Spanish programming for NBC. This is back in the 90s when I only had three or 4,000 people reading my stuff. Believe me, if you write with passion about who you are, it will be found. You just need to trust in the process of putting it out there. But you have to be transparent. And that's what's, I would have, how old is something else? Like 24-ish? 20-ish. 20 20-ish? 20 There's no way I would put myself out of your age. No way. But I'm trying to give you that acceleration now. If you do start sharing your part of the story, you will be in front of the employers that will give you the jobs that you actually thrive in. Or create the industry for yourself. Back. Yeah. I, we only have five more minutes, and I want to make sure they have a chance to ask you questions. Uh, I won't give you that Because I, I don't know who you <laughs> thought. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Um, so you guys have the floor. If you have any questions about what he does, I sent you guys a couple like YouTube videos just preparing you to let you know kind of what the style is of his background and training. So ask any questions you'd like. Anybody? Yes, sir. Mm. So do you currently have like any like facilities open where you train people? Or? We have, I now have gyms in 68 countries. <laughs> they all train in CST, circular strength there training. Two different, yeah, there are two different main systems, circular strength training, which is the tractional stuff, and then tactical fitness or TACFIT, which is the heart rate recovery method. Um, the TACFIT actually took over because of the, uh, any, any CrossFitters here? Okay, so some, the, the big gap in CrossFit training is the recovery from high intensity. What happens in between the, the rounds? Where, what do you strategically do with the rest periods? How fast you re can recover from a high intensity experience is what I focus on. So it can be any type of training. When you, are, when you exceed heart rate maximum, certain psychotropic things happen to the body, which the body recognizes only as stress. So it can accelerate aging in the people that I train. So that's why it's taken off. It's actually a dovetail from the, the high intensity interval training popularity. That's why it's so widespread. Any other questions? I saw some hands. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, what's your name, by the way? I didn't leave with my name. I don't remember. Scott so. Sonnen. I think I introduced him in the beginning, but. And if you're dyslexic like I am, it's Tox No Nos. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually up until, because I wrote mirror writing until third grade. I only knew myself as Tox Nono. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a real name, Scott's son. Yeah. I didn't know that. Listen, I know it's strange having someone like me up in front of you at the point where you are in your careers. But 
if there's anything that I can give you, I, I just want to reflect to you that you are you, the unique thing that you're bringing. You don't have to go out and acquire anything. All of those experiences are you just developing your strategies, but that's not what defines you. You do. The passion that you bring and the motivation behind it is what's going to make you a singular experience in the industry and lift up everyone as a result of your presence in it. So, when the doubts come, when you're out of here and the challenges are everywhere of how do I monetize this? Just try not to lose hope because it's going to be a, it's going to be an awful four or five years. It just is, and the only thing that's going to define you is: Have I found something I'm so passionate about that I will stay awake as long as it takes? I will work harder than anybody else because I love this. You will be obsessive compulsive, and that's okay. Just don't tell your parents about it. Thanks for your time.